Let's see the gross half of your face so I can get out of here. That nose better be piggy. Shut up. You shut up. Hey there, monster maniacs. It's Heidi from Channeling Spirits. In this modern age, where solitude and wearing a mask has become necessary, one man perfected that 110 years ago. Of course, we're talking about the Phantom of the Opera. Aside from his famous face wear, most people attribute a few other characteristics when they imagine the opera ghost. This includes his cape, evening attire, a wide-brimmed hat, and the horror beneath the mask. But how much of that is in the original novel, and how much has changed over time? Travel down the catacombs of history as we explore the Phantom's famous look and delve into his mysterious backstory. Before we begin, we have a few things to note. First of all, we don't speak French. So if we mispronounce anything, c'est la vie. We will also be using the English translation done by Alexander Texiera de Matos. We are fully aware of its flaws. Lastly, if you haven't read any version of Le Fantôme de l'Opera, or seen the numerous films of adaptations of it, we will be mentioning spoilers. You have been warned. And again, I don't speak French, nor do I have a good accent. All right, moving on. Gaston LaRue published his Gothic classic from 1909 to 1910 and serialized it in Le Galous. It was collected and printed as a novel with the first edition cover showcasing the opera ghost with the black domino mask. However, the novel's text describes the mask differently. I was in the hands of a man wrapped in a large cloak and wearing a mask that hid his whole face. It also mentions the phantom as the man in the black cloak and black mask. If you ever remove this mask, I'll... <gasps> this isn't the only mask that the opera ghost wears. Out in public, he wore a pasteboard nose with a mustache attached to it, instead of his horrible hole of a nose. The text describes the opera ghost most frequently wearing a black mask that covered his whole face, but certainly not the small domino mask on the cover. This would change several times throughout the years. The first edition available to American audiences included watercolor paintings by André Castaigne. Among these, one illustrates the phantom leering above Christine and Raoul, once again in a black domino mask. The promotional poster for the 1925 silent film also depicted him this way. In the film, he wears a full mask, lighter in shade, with a cloth covering his mouth. The first film to show the Phantom in color was in 1943, which began the trend of wearing a white mask. Hammer Films would give him a more horrifying disguise in 1962, with a featureless, leathery facade. For Andrew Lloyd Webber's 1986 musical, Designer Maria Bjorsen won a Tony Award for her work. It was her idea to make the wizard a half mask instead of a full mask. In the 1989 film, starring Robert Edlund, the Phantom wore the skin faces of his victims. As his face degrades, he later wears a scarf to hide his disfigurement. The Phantom is nearly always shown with a cape, but unlike Dracula, this description is repeatedly mentioned in the novel. While Lon Chaney Sr.'s portrayal had a dark cloak, promotional posters from both Universal Films often showed him in red. This may have been an illustration or influenced by his Red Death costume in The Masquerade. Claude Rain's Phantom wore a black cape with a red interior but later versions would largely feature a black cloak. Andrew Lloyd Webber's version also added some rocking sequins to it. 
the cloak is not the only fashionable attire the Phantom is known for. Being a man of the opera, he constantly dresses for a night out. Like many traits we attribute to his look, this came from the original novel. LaRue describes it as a gentleman in dress clothes and a specter dressed like a man of fashion or an undertaker. Sounds hot, right? The associate costume designer for the Broadway musical, Sam Fleming, states, For all his cruelty and immaturity, the Phantom is supposed to be the most elegant thing on stage. His suit is made of silk, so it has this sort of nice luminescence on stage. The fit, of course, always has to be like paint. He's sort of the most athletic person on stage, too. But while most actors portraying him had an average or athletic build, the book described him as emaciated. You meet so many men in dress clothes at the opera who are not ghosts. But this dress suit had a peculiarity of its own. It covered a skeleton. To go with his cape, tuxedo, and mask... Oh, it's Tuxedo Mask! He looks like a prince! No, the Phantom wears a hat. <laughs> oh, never mind. The novel describes this as a soft black felt hat. The book cover showcases him in a silk top hat, while the 1925 film would introduce the opera ghost in his famous fedora. Despite the differences in stories and settings, his wide-brimmed hat would soon become a staple in nearly every subsequent film. Even the Phantom's minions in The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen wear capes and wide-brimmed hats. Very operatic. Hiding under his hat and behind his mask was a face of horror. Some stories have him born with a deformity, while in others, he was disfigured as an adult. The former occurs in the original novel, which describes him having a terrible death's head, which darted a look at me from a pair of scorching eyes. The Phantom's eyes are later described as yellow, and a meticulous description of him is given. He is extraordinarily thin, and his dress coat hangs on a skeleton frame. His eyes are so deep that you can hardly see the fixed pupils. You see two big black holes, as in a dead man's skull. His skin, which is stretched across his bones like a drumhead, is not white, but a nasty yellow. His nose is so little worth talking about that you can't see its side face. And the absence of that nose is a horrible thing to look at. All the hair he has is three or four long dark locks on his forehead and behind his ears. Empty's face, Harry. It was horrible. Lon Chaney Sr.'s incredible makeup most accurately portrays this. The sunken skull-like eyes, lack of nose, and wisps of hair give him the death's head LaRue described. Being in black and white, it is hard to know what hue his skin was intended to be. However, years later, the Phantom would find himself illustrated with a greenish skin like Frankenstein's monster, but also more yellowed like the novel. 95 years later, Lon Chaney Sr.'s performance still resonates when we think of the opera ghost. Claude Rains and Herbert Lom are both burned with etching acid. jar full of the flames. Some of it splashed back in his face. Rains had a face only partially burned, while Lom developed gangrene skin, lost an eye, and was much more horrific. Even more grotesque was the 1989 film with Robert Englund. The explanation of his decrepit state was supernatural after the Phantom made a Faustian deal with the devil, 
for his brilliance, with the cost being his beauty. Would you wed your soul with the devil? Throughout the film, the skin he takes from his victims degrades and must be replaced, but he continues to become more horrific. The 1986 Broadway show returned to the novel's roots of him being naturally deformed. Who was this man? And while his initial appearance seems nearly normal, his grotesque features are eventually revealed. But beyond his disfigurement, who is the Phantom? The answer differs depending on the adaptation. The silent film says he was born during the Boulevard Massacre, which happened in February of 1848. The film also states he was found confined in torture chambers during the Second Revolution, which was also in 1848. This could mean he was imprisoned for his deformities or disfigured by torture, hence his birth. The book only states he was born in Rayon, France, and his deformities meant his father never saw him. His mother refused to kiss him, but instead would throw him his first mask. His parents never gave him a name. He said that it had no name and no country, and that he had taken the name of Eric by accident. Future film adaptations would largely keep with this tradition and occasionally added surnames. Claudin, Eric Claudin. Eric Gessler. Professor Petrie. How do you know my name? His father was a master mason, but given that he never made contact with him, it is unlikely that that's how he became an architect. Eric eventually ran away from his parents and frequented fairs, where a showman exhibited him as the living corpse. There was a traveling fair in the city. Eric then crossed Europe from fair to fair and was educated by gypsies in art and magic. At a fair in Russia, Eric showcased his incredible singing talent, practiced ventriloquism, and displayed letter germane. His skill was so incredible that the caravans of Asia sang praises of him in the Mazandarian province in modern-day Iran. Scholar, architect, musician, a composer, and an inventor too, monsieur. They boasted he had once built for the Shah of Persia a maze of mirrors. At some point, Eric learned to breathe through a reed underwater by the pirates of Tonkin, a northern part of modern-day Vietnam. A sultana in Mazandarian had grown bored and, upon hearing of Eric, ordered a Daragoga to bring him to Persia. He had lived in India and acquired an incredible skill in the art of strangulation. His noose was known as the Punjab Lasso, likely named after Punjab, a state in India. Eric would be in a courtyard and strangle people for the amusement of the sultana who learned to strangle others. He committed a number of political assassinations, including the Emir of Afghanistan, and gained favor with the Shah. Eric was also ordered to create a palace full of trap doors in hidden places, a skill he would use while constructing the Garnier Opera in Paris. Not wanting the secrets of his palace to be revealed, the Shah in Shah ordered Eric to be blinded but realized, even without his sight, he could still recreate it. The Shah ordered Eric to be executed, but the Daroga defied this. Eric fled to Asia Minor and then to Constantinople. He entered the employment of the Sultan, but was forced to leave for the same reason he left the Shah. He knew too much. While in Paris, he took on work as an ordinary contractor. And this was the easiest thing in the world for him to do, because Eric was one of the chief contractors under Philippe Garnier, the architect of the opera, and continued to work by himself when the works were officially suspended during the war, the siege of Paris, and the Commune. It was here where he would become the phantom of the opera and live out his final days. 
From the original text to subsequent adaptations, the opera ghost has become known for his mask, cloak, tuxedo, fedora, and disfigured face. While his appearance has changed slightly through the years, this is how Gaston LaRue originally described him. Time will only tell if that face changes once again or stays close to its source material as it has for more than a century. If you enjoyed this video and think we deserve it, Thank you. Thank you. Please subscribe. If you are in the position to help, please support us on Patreon and keep coming back for more spooktacular videos. I'm Heidi with Channeling Spirits, and thanks for watching. No, what I love best, Lottie said, is when I'm asleep in my bed. And the angel of music sings songs in my head. The angel of music sings songs in my head. I just realized we never mentioned Gerard Butler. But I hated it. Probably for a good reason. Whose horse is that?